Today, let me walk you through the seven food photography sins that newbies make. And hey, it's okay to be a noob. I mean, I've been there, you've been there. We have to start somewhere, right? And I, I've made all of these. I still make some of these. And so there's no shame. Well, after this video, there'll be a little bit of shame because you'll know these. So let me walk you through the seven food photography beginner mistakes and how to avoid them. I'm gonna demonstrate each one of these seven deadly food photography sins right here at the table so you can see kind of a live before and after example of each one. Okay, so I've set up pretty much every single one of these seven deadly sins into a single shot and it, it looks pretty bad but don't worry it'll get much much better as we progress and get to the final perfect shot okay so deadly sin number one is not enough light or multiple light sources this is probably the most common sin of them all and it's an easy one to fix basically you want to make sure that you have a really great nice bright single light source for your food photography right now my main light or my key light is turned down way too low. So I can easily turn this up to get a better exposure. But what happens if you're using some really nice natural light for your food photography? You can't really turn up the sun. And I love shooting with natural light, but the sun is not always dependable. So what you can do is one, change the exposure in your camera. That's really easy. It'll brighten up the image. And two, make sure that if you are shooting with natural light, use it unobstructed sunlight or you know direct sunlight beaming through your window and striking your table that will give you the brightness and contrast that you need in those highlights and shadows and if it's a little too contrasty a little too hard of shadows you could always diffuse it later on with some diffusion paper baking paper a white bed sheet you know what have you however now that i've turned up my constant light you can see the next big problem and that is i have two different light sources you really only want a single light source. And if for some reason you're using multiple different light sources like natural window light and constant lights like I am here, you wanna make sure that at least they're the same color temperature. Basically, if you're shooting with natural light, don't forget to turn off the overhead lights in your house or your kitchen, living room, the restaurant, the studio, wherever you're working at. So I could do one of two things, either change the color balance on my constant light to 56K to match the daylight white balance coming through my window here. You can see it looks pretty awful. We have a lot of natural light coming in here and then this warm light from my constant light coming in over here and mixing in the middle. Bluish on one end, warm and yellowish on the other. Or in my case, I have my constant light here set to tungsten white balance or 2800K and my window light, my natural window light is 5600K daylight. Right away, you can see that this has a huge impact on the color. But for this image, I don't think I really need that daylight coming through the window. So I'm just gonna close off my curtains and block off all that natural light. And you can see now that I have a single light source, things just got a whole lot more dramatic and my light became a lot more directional, which leads me to deadly sin number two. Horribly flat light. Real quick, let me open these curtains up one more time and you can see how all that fill light from the window completely wipes out my shadows. This is called flat light. It's boring, lacks contrast and direction. Light direction is really, really super important to the story of the image. Those you know, great highlights and shadows really cue in the viewer about where the light is coming from, the source of the light. It speaks to a world that's outside of the frame and adds that realism to your images. You know, even if the story is completely fake and built right here on the table. Let me close these curtains one more time. Not only does light direction add to the story, but it also gives your subject shape. The highlights and shadows help define the shape of your subject. The third deadly sin is not having a single subject. You always want a hero dish, one that stands out above everything else in the image. Most of the time this happens when your camera is above the table because everything is on the same plane. However, it also just happens when everything in the photo is really the same size and shape like these bagels. It also has a lot to do with how you compose the image. 
Nothing about my composition here tells the viewer what to look at. I haven't framed anything. I have no leading lines, no negative space that highlights any one thing over the other. I have no hero that stands above the rest. Speaking about that, deadly sin number four is crazy props. If you're using props in your food photography, the props need to match your story, or at the very least, you know, not take attention away from your food. For commercial type food photography, it's all about the concept. And you wanna make sure that your props match that concept. For editorial type shots, cookbooks and magazine images, you'll see photographers choose matte over glossy props muted colors over bright and poppy. They don't want reflections and colors to outshine the hero of the story. Okay, before we move on, I just have to fix number five. I can't hold out any longer. Deadly sin number five is your food falling off the table. To see what I mean, allow me to rotate this image. Right now, I mean, it looks okay, but as soon as I rotate it, you can see it looks like everything is just about to slide off the table. Buy a level like this one and just be sure to use it every time you place your camera above the table. Just do a quick check, you know, place it on the viewfinder to check the camera is level this way, then place it on the lens to check it is level the other way. Stop trying to handhold your camera above the table or, you know, at all ever for food photography. Number six on our list is creating a boring composition. Now, I'll admit that sometimes that's what the client wants. Sometimes commercial food photography is purely descriptive. You know, this is the food, this is the dish, and that's it. You know, it's a bowl, it's placed smack dab in the middle of the frame and nothing else. But if that's not what the purpose of an image is, then a boring composition is an image killer. There's a whole bunch of ways to make your compositions more interesting. Lines, layers, balance, shape, color. I mean, the point of it all is to keep the viewers looking at your image longer and keep them from looking away or out of the frame. Okay, so last but not least on this list of deadly food photography sins is number seven, which is food that has died on the table. Some food will obviously last longer than others. These bagels will last forever, but the cheese and you know other toppings won't last very long. Pre-planning your shoots by storyboarding, creating shot lists, drawing out your compositions can really speed things up. Also staging the entire scene, setting up the lighting, taking test shots, you know, all of that before the food comes out. I'm always joking that the last picture I take is the very best picture ever. And you know, it's mostly true because if I take 100 images per shoot, then the first 90 really are just me setting up the composition, you know, moving props around the table, making all those adjustments before the food arrives. And then once the food finally does hit the table, you know, it's maybe 10 images after that, making micro adjustments to the composition just to make sure that everything is the best that it can be. Fun fact! The world's longest noodle measures at over 10,119 feet and was created using over 88 pounds of bread flour, 7.6 gallons of water, 1.3 pounds of salt, and took over three hours to measure. Man, I need some more coffee.